This is the third in a short series on the topic of Sunday Laws in Bible Prophecy, part of the Prophecy Seminar Series of the Central California Conference. In the first part of the series, we looked at principles of biblical interpretation of prophecy drawn from fulfilled prophecy themselves, seeing how God moves from uh, prediction to fulfillment, from prior action to later action. Then in the second part, we took a look at Revelation 13, uh, which is the key text uh, for many people on the idea of Sunday laws in the future. And then in this session, we'll be taking a look at the key statements of Ellen G. White, the spirit of prophecy, as they pertain to the subject. This has become a really popular topic among Seventh-day Adventists, and I think that's the case because it's, uh, how should we put it, a clear, measurable sign. I mean, we would know that the American Congress would pass a national Sunday law. We would know that the president signs it. And if something that clear and that measurable takes place, I think most Adventists would say, wow, this has got to be the final events, uh, time to get ready if we're not ready already, and so forth. Very attractive idea. But is it accurate? Will things in fact happen exactly that way? Uh, that is the question. God is not predictable. And as a result, we need to be careful in the use that we make of such ideas. So let's take a look at the evidence from the spirit of prophecy. But before we do, let me repeat the prophetic principles that we discovered in the first session of this series of three. God is consistent. God is not predictable. God is creative. God meets people where they are. God spiritualizes history, and God uses the language of the prophets past and present to describe that future. Fulfillments are clearest as or after they occur. And finally, being aware of the distinction between classical and apocalyptic prophecy. And we concluded that Ellen White's style of prophecy is classical uh, rather than apocalyptic, and we'll uh, do a little bit more work on that as well. Uh, we concluded the previous session by noting that the biblical evidence does not speak of Sunday as such, but it speaks about a counterfeit of the Sabbath being critical to the mark of the beast at the end of time. And we noted there's four possibilities, four options for a counterfeit. One would be a different day than the Sabbath, and Sunday would be an example of that. Uh, a second option is that every day is a Sabbath, uh, which would mean that no day would have special significance. The third is that no day is the Sabbath. Sabbath was simply abolished by Jesus, and therefore we can worship on any day that we choose. And finally, uh, some sort of legislation to forbid Sabbath-keeping would be option number four. So within exegesis of the biblical text, you do have options for understanding what the mark of the beast will actually uh, turn out to be. When you get to the writings of Ellen White, however, things get much more specific. And I'd like to look carefully with you at uh, about five major statements she makes about Sunday laws and the significance uh, that they have for the topic. In Great Controversy, page 573, is the following statement, which you will see on the screen. In the movements now in progress in the United States to secure for the institutions and usages of the church the support of the state, Protestants are following in the steps of Papists. I just stop there for a moment and notice she says movements now in progress in the United States. Remember when we talked about prophetic principles, that classical prophets are speaking to an immediate situation. There were things going on in the United States at the time she wrote that she felt were significant in relation to Revelation 13. Uh, going down a, a bit further, it says, that which gives greater significance to this movement 
is the fact that the principal object contemplated is the enforcement of Sunday observance, a custom which originated with Rome and which she claims as the sign of her authority. All right, so Ellen White said that the, the object of the events taking place in her day was the enforcement of Sunday observance. So in this particular passage, uh, the key from her understanding is that the mark of the beast, the counterfeit of the Sabbath, would be the enforcement of Sunday observance. All right, another statement in Great Controversy uh, is also helpful. It has been shown that the United States is the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns, and that this prophecy will be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance. So here it's very specific, uh, very measurable. The United States is the power that will legislate uh, Sunday, that that will be the indicator that we are in the significant times uh, that she was talking about. Uh, Further down, you'll notice in bold, it says, in both the old and the new world, the papacy will receive homage in the honor paid to the Sunday institution. So Ellen White here suggests that not just the United States would enforce Sunday observance, but that this would also take place in the old world, as she called it, Uh, which is Europe. So Sunday legislation could be expected not just in the United States, but also uh, in Europe. And then toward the end, since the middle of the 19th century, students of prophecy in the United States have presented this testimony to the world in the events now taking place is seeing a rapid advance toward the fulfillment of the prediction. Now, remember in our principles of prophecy that uh, classical prophecy is always a natural extension of the prophet's time and place. The language here fits that perfectly. In the events now taking place is a rapid advance toward fulfillment of the prediction. A third statement, also from Great Controversy, page 592. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. Notice there are multiple methods, not just forcing people to worship on Sunday, but seeking to persuade them to do so, to bribe them if necessary uh, to do so. Uh, So the, the whole idea is getting people to comply, hopefully from the heart, but uh, if necessary, simply uh, as a self-defense. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth, and even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. So here, I think it's very, very clear we're talking about the United States, and we are talking about in the United States, uh, there will be legislation at the national level. There's been legislation at the local level for centuries, but at a specific point in time, legislation at a national level will be kind of the trigger uh, that the events of Revelation 13 are coming uh, to be fulfilled. And then finally, she says, Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected in the soon coming conflict. So in her mind, this was not something that was going to happen way, way in some far future place. She understands that the things she is talking about are in action, in motion, and are to be fulfilled very, very soon. Uh, Fourth statement from uh, Bible Commentary, uh, Volume 7, page 976, uh, a comment that was added into the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. Uh, Ellen White says, the decree enforcing the worship of this day, speaking of Sunday, is to go forth to all the world. Now, that's an additional element. 
the idea that Sunday laws will not just happen in the United States, but the entire world will go along with it. That's a huge expansion of the concept. And she goes on to say, in a limited degree, it has already gone forth. In several places, the civil power is speaking with the voice of a dragon, just as the heathen king spoke to the Hebrew captives. So here she says that this uh, worship of Sunday is something that, to a degree, is already happening around the world. It's part of her understanding at this point in time. And finally, a review in Herald, December 18, 1888, You have the following interesting statement. (laughs) When our nation, in its legislative councils, shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance. Remember the four options? Enforcing Sunday observance was the one that she understands God to be leading her to. She says, and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, The law of God will to all intents and purposes be made void in our land. So she sees clearly enforcing of Sunday observance, evidently with a national uh, congressional uh, approval, is uh, something that will be uh, critical to the events uh, of the end time. And then finally, if in our land of boasted freedom, a Protestant government should sacrifice every principle which enters into its constitution and propagate papal falsehood and delusion, well may we plead, it is time for thee, O Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. So she understands that it will be a Protestant government that would sacrifice every principle and and put forth this Sunday legislation. So there's a series of very specific, uh, very measurable kinds of things as to when these particular statements would be fulfilled. Now, a word of caution. And these are my words, and I put them on the screen, uh, not because they have uh, divine authority of any kind, but out of careful study of fulfilled prophecy, out of careful study of the book of Revelation, and reading these statements with the biblical principles in mind, we should be careful not to assume that the end time will be identical to great controversy in every detail. For example, the idea of a worldwide Sunday law already in action made a lot of sense in the 1880s because at the time, uh, the entire world was ruled by Christians. It's a colonial period, and European nations uh, controlled uh, Africa, uh, South America, uh, large parts uh, of Asia, etc., And so the idea of a worldwide Sunday law made a lot of sense back then. The world is quite different today. So we should not assume that after the passage of more than 150 years, or about 150 years, that every detail would necessarily be fulfilled. Remember Isaiah 11. Considering both the Bible and world history, were Ellen White alive today, there's at least a chance that her depiction of the end would be different than it was in the 1880s. Now, remember the scholar and the believer. Okay, this is the scholar speaking, not in any way calling into question uh, the gift that God gave to Ellen White or the accuracy of what God would have shown her back when she wrote, but just noting that on the basis of fulfilled prophecy in the Bible, there is reason to say God is not always predictable. Let's take a look at those relevant principles. God is not always predictable. That means not every detail of a classical prophecy will necessarily be fulfilled exactly as stated. God meets people where they are. This prophecy is clearly given in a specific context of history. And it fits within that context. If the end had come in Ellen White's lifetime, I have no doubt that it would have happened essentially the way that she said. Number six, God uses the language of the prophets past and present. It's a natural extension. 
And we will see how uh, great controversy fits perfectly with exactly what is happening in the world in the 1880s. Fulfillments are clearest after they occur. So I think we make a mistake in putting lines in the sand and saying it must happen exactly this way, when in fact we see God being uh, creative, not always predictable, uh, the natural extension meaning that things have changed in the world. If God were uh, giving a prophecy today, it wouldn't sound like what was given back then, because we're in a different world, different language, different circumstances, different time and place. And finally, as a classical prophet, uh, Ellen White's prediction should be understood also as conditional. That as circumstances change, the fulfillment of Revelation 13 could take other forms uh, than the ones that seemed so clear in 1888. So what was the immediate situation in which most of these statements were made? There were three threats to that Adventists felt and that they felt America should be concerned about. In other words, Adventists back then were not just talking about their own situation, but they were saying America is changing and America is facing three threats to its existence. So this is a powerful message, you know, evangelistically. Threat number one would be Protestant apostasy. Adventists understood that the power of the United States was in its Protestant government, in its principles that were grounded in religious liberty, grounded in the Reformation, grounded in the gospel. And as Protestantism Protestantism began to slip from its adherence to the Reformation, that uh, this would bring into danger the principles of the Constitution, the very existence of the United States itself. So the apostasy of Protestantism from the Reformation was already visible at that point in time and was a major concern in the book Great Controversy. Second, Catholicism. Uh, Catholicism played virtually no role in the public life of the United States until the 1880s. In uh, the 1840s, uh, Catholics made up about 5% of the American population. But by the 1880s, they made up 17%. Immigration from Ireland and uh, Italy and Spain and Poland uh, began to bring in large numbers of Catholics. Up until that time, Catholicism had not played a role in the public square in the United States. But in the 1880s, when Protestants sought to bring forward a national Sunday law in the Senate, and uh, people who know the situation may remember a Senator Blair, you can uh, Google that, who introduced a national Sunday law around the year 1888. In that context, Cardinal Gibbon, one of the key leaders of North American Catholicism, threw his weight behind that. So for the first time, Protestantism and Catholicism were, so to speak, clasping hands across a gulf. It was something new in American history and became a centerpiece of what we see in Great Controversy. A third threat that Adventists saw to the United States was the rise of spiritualism. It began in 1848 and by the 1880s was a credible player in popular thinking in the United States. It wasn't just something that happened behind the scenes, but uh, spiritualism was widely recognized and credibility was given to it. And so when Ellen White speaks about Protestantism reaching its hand across the gulf to grasp Catholicism and spiritualism, a threefold unity, that is a beautiful description of exactly the political situation of the United States in the 1880s when the Sunday Law was introduced. So Protestants, of course, were reacting uh, to all of this. They were concerned, many Protestants were concerned that the United States was losing its character, was losing the principles that had made it great. And the reaction was twofold. 
First of all, to recover a Protestant America, the idea was to introduce prohibition, temperance laws, that uh, people would go back to uh, the ways of the country before. Uh, You see, uh, the arrival of many, many Catholics in places like uh, New York and Boston uh, brought with them the bars that were very, very uh, common in Ireland, uh, for example, and uh, parties, carnivals, these kind of things were common in Roman Catholic countries. These customs were being brought to Protestant America, which was the strictest kind of Protestantism. No wedding rings, no dancing, uh, no booze, uh, no bars, no carnivals, all that kind of stuff. Seventh-day Adventists were very much traditional Protestants in all of those areas uh, in the 19th century. But uh, with the arrival of so many Catholics, many felt like the character of the United States was being destroyed. And so one way to counter that would be uh, through prohibition, to forbid uh, the manufacture, uh, the sale, and the consumption of alcohol in the United States. With that particular reaction, Adventists were very comfortable, and Ellen White actually went to temperance and prohibition meetings and lent her voice as a a popular speaker to those movements. But a second thing was different. Sunday legislation was seen by many as the way to recapture the Protestant spirit of America, to recapture the principles of Christianity at the center of America's government. And here, Adventists beg to differ. They say, actually, Sunday legislation would be a bigger threat to the future of the United States than would alcohol be. So there's the context in which these amazing statements were made. But there have been many changes in the world since then. And this, all of this has got to affect the way that we read Uh, what was uh, projected. First of all, spiritualism rapidly lost its place in the public discourse in the United States. It still exists today. Uh, It's it's in the back rooms and uh, out in the forests and things like that. But it doesn't have the credibility of a political voice in the country. That faded rapidly after the 1880s. Second of all, Catholicism in the U.S., after the Sunday legislation failed, retreated back to its quiet position, and until Vatican II was not a major voice in, uh, in American politics. It was with John F. Kennedy and Vatican II both happening at the same time that Catholicism began to find its voice and attempt to influence the direction that the United States uh, was going uh, politically and governmentally. So uh, the idea of Catholicism as a major threat was very real in the 1880s and to some degree as far as 1905, but uh, then there was a quiet period again until Vatican II. By Ellen White's death, there was a new threat to Protestantism, and that was secularism or liberalism. It doesn't get a whole lot of uh, notice in the writings of Ellen White because it's something that particularly developed in the teens and the 20s of uh, the 20th century. But secularism and liberalism more and more was becoming at the center of public discourse. You think of the Scopes trial. uh, You think of the battle over prohibition and so on. Uh, All of these were part of uh, this... uh, reaction against uh, this rise of secularism and liberalism in the United States. So prohibition then became Protestantism's last stand. If you want to talk about a Protestant government, uh, that uh, probably ended with the end of prohibition. Uh, With the Scopes trial and the end of prohibition, Protestantism no longer had a controlling power over American discourse. Diversity Uh, became, for the first time, a reality there. And that diversity has only increased since, to where today uh, non-Christian voices uh, often are as powerful in the American discourse as uh, Christian voices in general are. And finally, another major shift in the world is the end of colonialism. In Ellen White's day, 
most of the world was ruled by Christians. Most of the world could conceivably have moved in the direction of Sunday legislation. Today, two-thirds of the world is made up of non-Christian leadership. And that is a very different picture uh, than it was uh, before. So the question is, if Ellen White were alive today, would she still be talking about Sunday laws? And if so, in what way would she be talking about them? How would these things work out in today's world? Let's take a look again at the evidence of Ellen White herself, the statements that we have read. She says, movements now in progress. In the events now taking place, is seen a rapid advance toward the fulfillment of the prediction. The soon coming conflict. The decree has already gone forth. A Protestant government. You see, all of those things make sense. In around 1888 to 1890, when there was national legislation to promote the worship of Sunday in the United States Senate. And the possibility of such a law nationwide uh, was seen to be real. So the evidence of Ellen White herself, she's talking about the near future. She's talking about a world that was very real in the 1880s, but no longer exists today. It's no longer a Protestant government. Uh, It's no longer a world in which spiritualism is at the top of the radar and the agenda. It's no longer a colonial world. So the world is a very different place. What she was describing in Great Controversy was about her present and her near future. And so it's interesting that when you think of the book Great Controversy, there are actually seven editions of Great Controversy. And in the earlier editions, you have no mention of a Sunday law in Congress. No mention of this national Sunday law. There's mention of Sunday legislation because that's been there throughout American history, going all the way back to the pilgrims. So Sunday legislation is not a new thing in the United States, but the idea of a national Sunday law uh, would be something quite different uh, from what the Constitution of the United States had set up. What she was talking about in the 1880s was a new situation. And if you look carefully at the evidence of Ellen White, you'll notice that she does not address the world that we live in today directly. Her predictions are a natural extension of the world of her day. You will look in vain for a nuclear war or nuclear power. You'll look in vain for computers, internet, cell phones, space travel, world wars, Islamic terrorism, rise of secularism, the rise of postmodernism, and so on. She does not address our world. That is typical of the Bible prophets. They spoke to their world, the immediate situation. And there are principles there that we can extrapolate for the end of time. But these are usually not the kind of specific, measurable, actionable statements that would give us a chart of specific events at the end. In the seven editions of Great Controversy, she updated many things. She changed a number of things as circumstances changed. That's what we see in the biblical prophets. Isaiah was a prophet for 60 years, much like Ellen White. And you see, as you go through Isaiah, you can see the change in his language, the change in the tone, uh, the change in optimism gets more and more optimistic as you go through uh, Isaiah, more and more gloomy toward the beginning, but optimistic toward the end. So she was a classical prophet, like Isaiah. And classical prophecies are conditional. Jeremiah 18, 7 to 10. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up, break down, and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I've spoken turns from its evil, I will relent to the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, 
And if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. This is a general statement of Bible prophecy that Ellen White herself said applies uh, to all situations. That prophecy is conditional because we serve a God who is deeply engaged with our lives and with our history. Circumstances alter cases. And circumstances have changed drastically in the last 125 plus years uh, since the statements that we read earlier. Let's notice just a little bit of that shift within Ellen White herself. Fascinating, but it makes perfect sense. It's not troubling to me because the Bible writers do the same thing. Uh, One of the principles that God uses the language of the past and present, that a prophet's statements are natural extensions of the time and place in which the prophet is writing. Notice this statement that I found from 1850. So this is almost 40 years before the statements regarding National Sunday Law in Congress and regarding the influence of Catholicism on the United States. Those statements all made perfect sense in 1888, 1889, 1890. But notice how she describes it in 1850. Then I saw the mother of harlots. In case you're wondering, that's a reference to Revelation 17. Uh, which uh, she understood to be the great end-time religious alliance against the people of God. She says, Then I saw the mother of harlots. She has had her day, and it is past. That's a stunning statement, because she's basically saying that Catholicism has had its day when it was in charge of things. That day is now in the past. Now, that's not what she's saying 40 years later, but it makes perfect sense in 1850, because in 1850, Catholics made up about 5% of the American population, and they had no influence on the government or on the main functioning of the United States. Within that time and place, 1850, this statement makes perfect sense. Catholicism is not going to be central if the Sunday law or any of that were to happen in the next few years. It is a Protestant government, as she said, her daughters, the Protestant sects, were next to come on the stage and act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints, past tense. So she sees at that point that if the end were to come in the context of 1850, that the, it would be a Protestant move that would copy the kind of things that the papacy did in the Middle Ages, and that that would lead us in the direction of, uh, that would be concluded. So in 1850, a different situation, a different time and place. Again, natural extension. Look at this statement, 1886, before the statements about Sunday legislation. The Christian world has sanctioned Satan's efforts by adopting this child of the papacy, the Sunday institution. They have nourished it and continue to nourish it until Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power. See, that's different from 1850. The idea of Protestantism working together uh, with uh, the Roman power. But notice this. Then there will be a law against the Sabbath of God's creation. Remember the four options? Then there will be a law against the Sabbath. And it's interesting, if you look at the later statements, Ellen White did not fear Sunday legislation itself. She said, "Eh, if they say you can't work on Sunday, fine, we'll do missionary work. Not a problem. But legislation against Sabbath worship uh, would be a great threat. So you see that... If you want to take seriously what Ellen White says, you want to take seriously the entire body of her work, the entire context. And in the light of Scripture, she often said, don't take my word for it till you understand what the Bible is saying. And what the Bible is saying is that the mark of the beast is a counterfeit of the Sabbath. But that can take a number of forms, as we see even in her own 
uh, writing about this text. So it's exegetically defensible to say that Sunday legislation would be part of the mark of the beast. Uh, the evidence of revelation is open to that. It's also exegetically defensible to say that legislation against the Sabbath might be part of that mark. Four options. Another day, every day, no day, forbidding of Sabbath keeping. Why is this important? It's because there are two ways to undermine prophecy. One way to undermine prophecy is to ignore it. To act like it didn't happen, to just say, we know better, we're not going to pay attention to some old book, we're not going to pay attention to some dead lady, uh, we are serious about this world and understanding what's going to happen uh, on the basis of science or any other resource that we have. Ignoring prophecy is a dangerous place to go for believers. But there's another way to undermine prophecy, and that is to over-specify the prophecy. To be too confident that we understand every detail in advance. And out of that confidence, putting charts together and, and, and they signifies events of the end in such a way that when the real thing comes, you miss it. You don't see it because it doesn't fit the expectations that you've put together. Now, the reason I'm concerned about this is I'm a scholar of first century Christianity. And in first century Christianity, exactly that thing happened. There were people studying the prophecies of the Old Testament about the Messiah. There were people who were making charts of messianic events, signs of when the Messiah would come. There were whole books written about it. How do we know? Because we have many of these books today. You can read them in English translation. Uh, books like First Enoch, books like Fourth Ezra, uh, books like Second Baruch. Do you know who wrote these books? They were called Pharisees. They were deep students of prophecy. But when Messiah came, they rejected him because he didn't fit their expectations. They didn't notice that while God is consistent, he is not predictable. And he can be creative. And he meets the prophet in the prophet's time and place. And the prophecies are a natural extension. After all, the messianic prophecies say Jesus will be a king like David. Well, how is he a king like David? Is he going to murder 201 innocent people? Is he going to commit adultery with one of his best friend's wife? No, probably not. To say that he'll be a king like David gives you a lot of ideas, but no specifics. He'll be a prophet like Moses. He'll be a priest like Aaron and Melchizedek. And when the Pharisees read those prophecies, they specified them with great detail. And when Messiah came, he didn't fit. Because God particularly spiritualized the prophecies. And Jesus' kingdom was not like the kingdom of this world. So by over-specifying the prophecies, the Pharisees missed the real deal when it came. Could Adventists do the same thing? If we are waiting for a specific piece of legislation in Congress... Before we get ready for the end, we could be making a big mistake. The end could come, and we're not ready, because we're still looking for that Sunday law in Congress. Could it happen? Certainly it could. But what if it does not? National Sunday laws were very, very relevant in the 1880s. And I have no doubt that if the end had come within that immediate context, would have played a central role. They may become relevant again. But you notice the may, based upon biblical principles, they may become relevant again. But as circumstances alter cases, God may choose to do something different than we expected. Be aware of the prophecies. Study them carefully. Be aware of the options. And then observe 
the environment. I believe it is unwise for us to use this particular idea as the sign of the end, as the one thing that we're all looking for to say, yeah, I think we're in the final crisis. In the end, it may happen in surprising ways. You see, after all, Ellen White spoke about Sunday legislation throughout her life. I've looked at more than 100 statements throughout her life. It's there. There was Sunday legislation in the United States all through those decades that she served in her ministry. So the idea of Sunday being particularly significant to the mark of the beast uh, certainly was a common theme in her writings. But the idea of a specific legislation in Congress, that's the key idea that gets people excited. And that occurs only in statements around 1888 through 1890. Uh, Some statements may be repeated in later writings, but if you look to the actual writing of the statement, that was the time when these things were written. There was a specific context that called for that specificity. But to assume that exactly that context will repeat at the end is not a safe assumption. It could. In fact, I talk about the Goldstein scenario. Clifford Goldstein suggested a way in which a worldwide Sunday law could occur. He notes, truthfully, that if the old setting never returns, and historically that would be unlikely, at least in terms of how history functions, how uh, cultures grow and develop. If that old setting never returns, is there a new setting, a current setting, that could lead in that direction? And he points out that all the great world religions anticipate some kind of future figure to complete the faith. Within Christianity, it's Jesus, second coming. Uh, Among the Jews, it would be the coming of the Messiah. Among the Muslims, it would be the coming of the Mahdi. Among the Hindus, it would be Kalki. Among the Buddhists, Maitreya. Every one of these religions has a tradition in which it is attempting to see events of the end as taking place, including some messianic type figure. In the book Great Controversy and in Thessalonians and Revelation, one can see the concept of a counterfeit of the ministry and second coming of Jesus, particularly 2 Thessalonians 2. And this is quoted in great controversy and uh, spelled out in some detail that in the final crisis of earth's history, Satan will come and impersonate the ministry of Christ and his second coming. In that context, he will get the attention of the entire world. And if such a figure were to speak in a language that would meet all the five world religions and say, now that I have come, the one that you've been waiting for, there's only one of me. You all had different names, but I'm all of these. And I'm telling you that if you want to be on board, uh, you will make worship on Sunday mandatory worldwide. Could happen. Such a thing could happen. Satan's dazzling end time appearance could bring the world to a place where they might consider such a thing. So as we look to the future, I encourage you to carefully weigh Bible prophecy, and particularly fulfilled prophecy. Speculation about unfulfilled prophecy has gotten us nowhere. It's been a failure pretty much every time it's tried. But when the prophecy is fulfilled, you will understand the hand of God. So weigh The biblical writings weigh the spirit of prophecy carefully, especially with the light of the larger principles we've been talking about. Carefully weigh events in today's world. Unfortunately, that's getting harder and harder to do, as truth itself is harder to find. You have one statement here, a contradictory statement. Both sides claim uh, the evidence that supports their side. It's harder and harder for people to understand today's world. It's easy for people to speculate and create conspiracy theories by ignoring some of the evidence that is there. So carefully weigh these things. And above all else, wholehearted prayer as we approach the end. We need prayer as we've never prayed before, study as we've never studied before, as we face the challenges 
of a world like we've never seen before. I'd like to close with prayer as we conclude this three-part series on Sunday laws and prophecy. Lord, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the Bible that read as a whole gradually transforms us into your image. I pray that you might do so more and more and particularly guide our curious minds as we seek to understand the future. Help us to see the large principles. Help us to see your character, which is truly at the heart of it all. And when the day comes that you truly return, may we all be found faithful. It's my prayer in Jesus' name.